action today. Is based on a book that I wrote some quite a number of years ago, actually, which is part of the monograph series of the psychoanalytic study of the child. It's monograph number two, and it's still available. And it was called Early Childhood Disturbances, the Infantile Neurosis and the Adulthood Disturbances, Problems of a Developmental Psychoanalytic Psychology. And uh, in those days, so that you have an idea, the managing editors of the psychoanalytic study of the child were Ruth Eisler, Heinz Hartmann, Anna Freud, and Mariana Chris, very distinguished people, because uh, that was some years back. In any case, <clears throat> what you're going to hear today is a very condensed summary of the contents of this book. And I want to tell you a little bit about why I wrote it. And I wrote it at the Hampstead Clinic. We had a number of, obviously, research projects at the clinic. And one of the interests that we had is what you have come to know as a developmental profile, or an Freud diagnostic profile. And uh, in doing diagnosis, um, we had the problem of the nosological classification of the times, just as now you have the problem of the SM4 uh, revised, which is obviously something that we all need to use because it's the only way you can uh, uh, negotiate with insurance companies and third party payers and they require the, the use of this uh, instrument. But as you well know, it's essentially a descriptive type of diagnosis and nothing to do with anything else. With nothing to do with etiology, nothing to do with causation, nothing to do with the genetics of the disorder or the mental history of the disorder, nothing to do with anything else. It's, it's just sheer descriptive psychiatry, which has been very popular and certainly very useful for many, many, many years uh, in, in this field. And of course the real masters of it were, was what was known possibly in the 40s and 50s as the French School of Psychiatry. They were enormously good at descriptions and uh, that was what psychiatry was. People could describe what they observed but the rest of it, what was behind the description of that behavior was an absolute mystery. Nobody knew why people suffered from these disorders or what their causation was or things of that kind. And that's obviously it's a very unsatisfactory state of affairs because essentially it's a system that says if you have four of these and three of these other and it started before such and such an age, then you have uh, bipolar disorder or manic depressive illness. And it has gone, as you know, through a large number of revisions. And um, personally, I think, quite frankly, that rather than getting better, it has gotten worse because they have lumped together uh, disorders that don't belong together, and that has created, uh, in my, to my mind at least, in my opinion, some degree of confusion in the psychopharmacology <coughs> and treatment of some of these disorders. What I mean by that is that they have lumped together, for example, reactive depression with endogenous depression as if they were one and the same ent entity and responded to the same kind of medication and that's absolutely not true and leads to all kinds of problems and uh, things of that kind. In any case, <coughs> what we were trying to do is to understand how a human being, a human being gets put together how do we get to be what we become, given our genetic givens and our experiences in development and given the environment in which we grow up and the culture to which we belong and things of that kind. And we wanted to look at it developmentally. That's why you see that the subtitle of the book is 
problems of, develop, of a developmental psychoanalytic psychology. That's what we wanted to do. We were not so interested in developing definition of nosological entities, but of taking a wide look, a bird's eye view, at human development. What happens? Why does this happen? When does it happen? How it does link together in some form or another and how it finally makes of us what each one of us is, which is a very unique uh, individual. We are all, as is frequently uh, said, alone to ourselves. But that alone to ourselves has meaning, has a history, and has genetic roots that can be disentangled. And possibly, if we put enough uh, effort into it, much of it can be seen as a progression from the moment of birth, or possibly from the moment of conception, or even earlier, to the point at which we are observing that particular patient of individual. So what I'm going to describe to you is a kind of a skeleton of theoretical issues that are highly clinical and practical and observable and very useful. Uh, if you think diagnostically, but not if you are thinking in terms of DSM-4 to build a third party payer, but if you are thinking of a human being and what is happening to him, why is that happening to him, and how it got to be that this is happening to him. That's different. And I think it's important, it is essential. Unfortunately, it's being lost in psychiatry. Yeah, it's, um, but that's very unfortunate in my judgment. In any case, the the first one that I want to uh, give you is if you let me, let me g move to the title and that you see what I'm going to talk about is complies in that title. Developmental interference is a group of phenomena developmental conflicts, and I will uh, define all of this for you and give you examples and show you how these things interact with one another and finally we get to be what we are going to get to be, neurotic conflicts, the infantile neurosis, which is still, in my judgment, the very basis of any other adult disturbance. That's the first form of a structure of the personality for the better and for the worse. Uh, the good aspects of it would have been consolidated at that particular point in time. Whatever lacks or defects came with the good aspects would have been consolidated at the same time and organized in the certain forms of psychopathology that are very familiar to us. Obviously, the infantile neurosis then is a prototype of all the later neurosis. In fact, all the adult neuroses are based on your infantile neurosis. And the concept of the infantile neurosis is a complex one, as you will see when we get to it. In any case, let's talk about um, what we mean. That's who I am. I think most of you know that. But uh, for our international audience, it's good to have it there for a second or two. And um, these are the developmental interferences. And the concept is very simple. Anything that is alive and goes through a growth process, that is a beginning, a middle, and an end in terms of life, you know, there is a birth whatever form for birth it may be, either out of a seed or either out of the womb of a woman, whatever it is that is alive, follows processes of development in order to reach from that beginning to the end. And these processes, depending on what you are thinking of, and you can think of anything at all in the world, you can think of a plant, you can think of an animal, you can think of a human being have 
certain ideal conditions that for that particular species are the ideal conditions to develop in the best possible manner. Anything that departs from that is taken from that ideal. Still will continue the development, but it's moving away from the ideal, you know. It's like an examination. <laughs> Instead of getting a hundred, you will get ninety or eighty or seventy or sixty or fifty or forty or completely be fail and be suspended, yeah. So and for a, to, just to give you a few examples maybe from botany, there are plants that do very well in a valley. They grow to be enormous trees, <laughs> you know, you plant an oak tree. Uh, a Florida oak tree here anywhere in this and in a few years you have an enormous tree you try and put that at 4,000 feet in a mountain and you'd be lucky if it grows to be a, bu a bush and if it is a little higher and it gets a little colder it will kill it after a certain amount of time in other words it can grow in there what does that mean? that means that certain conditions alter the potential for ideal development. In this case that we are talking about is the temperature, the amount of light that is available, the kind of soil that is available in, the, in contrast uh, uh, to the valley in the mountain, and the height, the amount of oxygen, and things of that kind. Clearly, for that Florida oak, there are certain conditions that are ideal. If you put it in this condition, it will grow to be a majestic tree. You put it anywhere else, and it'd be a little bush at best if it doesn't get killed. All right? Well, whatever the part from these ideal conditions that will lead to the maximum expression of the genetic potential of that thing that is alive, is a developmental interference. And there are many types of developmental interferences. And you see here, I define them as whatever distur disturbs the typical unfolding of development for whatever species we are going to talk about human beings now. The term may be reserved to describe First, those situations that involve gross external environmental interferences with certain needs and rights of the child, or situations in which unjustified demands are made of him, her, so these are environmental, external, they come from the outside, they are imposing on this living creation. And there are what I call internal developmental interferences which come from inside that organism, but will disturb the process of development very significantly. For example, pain, early on in life, practically any point in life, but, but in the developmental process early on in life will have a terrific negative impact in the development of a human uh, mind. And it's not that uncommon. There are any number of conditions early on in life that create these kind of problems. There are such things as um, let me go back here as deafness in a child or blindness in a child. Now these are developmental interferences that are not based on environmental factors that are affecting the process of growth, they come from inside, from the internal environment of that living organism. To give you a reasonable example of this, let me take you to deafness and I will tell you a little about blindness. Don't know how many of you are aware of this, but it's a good example and will uh, make very clear what I have in mind. Language development, like many other things that we learn, and we have to do a lot of learning, 
before we become adults and before we become masters of our own mind, of our own emotions and our own lives. It's all done by means of learning. We are an animal that is unfortunately or fortunately endowed with intelligence and when that happens you escape the stimuli response of other animals that simply respond to a stimuli with an inbuilt in the genetic bullpen response that, the response that cannot be changed because we are intelligent we have to learn how to respond and how you respond may have any number an infinite number an infinite variety of responses to a given stimuli most animals can do that there is a stimuli they produce a response that's why we have survived and will have more potential for survival than most other species language development as i said like anything else that we have to learn and we have to learn everything before we become adults is based on a critical sensitive period and that's true of a lot of things for which brain development is required <laughs> and what we call the mind is nothing but the functional expression of that brain that is inside these bones of our head now so there is a sensitive period of early auditory brain development that begins at birth or even in the womb, some people think, and ends at about six months. First six months of life. Notice that. Without exposure to sound and to language, through hearing aids or cochlear implants in these first months for these children that are born deaf, stone deaf, Children who are deaf and hard of hearing may suffer linguistic challenges that persist through their childhood. Now, if you don't master language properly, you don't master conceptual elements either. Your capacity for abstract thinking is very limited because words are the symbols that we use to operate in abstract terms. And if you don't have a mastery of this, and can use that elegantly. Your level of intelligence goes down at an incredible speed and the amount of processing that you can do of information is extraordinarily limited because you have to use visual, concrete imagery, not word symbols to deal with the problems that you have to handle during your life. And there is an enormous difference between one possibility and the other, yeah? So the good news though is, so if, in fact, as you will see now, the good news is that when amplification and intervention begins before six months for these children, they are able to develop a spoken language in a step with their hearing peers. They suffered no damage. The difference between a born dead child that hadn't been subjected to these systems that make it possible for him or her to hear sounds and to be familiar with language that they don't understand anything that is being told to them. Just the sounds, the brain, you know. It reminds me, the other day, um, Joey and I, there's a program, as you know, in computers that uh, you train the computer to uh, to understand your language, even somebody with my accent. But you have to read to the computer a large number of stories before the computer can make sense of it and then respond to your commands. Something similar is happening in the human brain. They don't understand. The computer doesn't understand the meaning of the word, but hear the sound. And it can identify if that sound is equal to this sound or not, and so on. In any case, <coughs> with hearing aids, which are not available and are now available and more important with cochlear implants and early intervention children who are deaf and hard of hearing can learn to listen and to speak for themselves look just like a, a child that is not born deaf at all so there is a critical period has to happen between zero birth and six months 
you do this at the year old, he has already lost an enormous amount of potential to use language adequately, appropriately, and to catch up to his peers. In fact, he will never catch up to the level of his peers. And that seems, you say, well, so what? He may not speak as elegantly as somebody else. No, it's not that simple. Language is our symbolic means of thinking in abstract terms. And if that is handicapped, you are severely handicapped. So that's why infant hearing loss demands immediate amplification and intervention. This is one way of doing it. It's called a cochlear implant. And as you see there, there is, this is a microphone, which is implanted in the bone here. And it's open to the outside. Behind that is a receiver. You <laughs> high fidelity system at home. There is a receiver. The microphone passes the information to the receiver, which through strong wires, it gets two electrodes, go to the cochlea, here where there are little hairs that are the ones that we used to hear. They are there, and if you lose them, you go deaf. And we all lose some of them, and we go older, some of them lose a lot of them. And then we are very deaf. So, <clears throat> as you see, it's a very interesting thing. There is a microphone which transmits the information to the receiver who sends it to the cochlea element in the internal auditory system and that produces an electrical discharge that the brain can read and is very effective. Do you know you're aware there is a a talking head in this country, very famous, called Rush Limbaugh. You heard of Rush Limbaugh? Rush Limbaugh developed total deafness very quickly. He's totally deaf. Very, very quickly. And uh, the problem got solved for him that way. Of course, that happened to him as an adult. He lost his hearing as an adult, but they use this system. Well, the same system can be used if you identify a child that is deaf at birth. You can do that immediately, all right? Sometimes you don't need to go that far. You can use a hearing aid and you solve the problem just the same, but not always. So this is what you will have to do. You schedule a follow-up screening, you provide referrals to audiologists, otorrhinolaryngologists, speech pathologists, and deaf education experts. And you put the parents in contact with uh, community resources and national support systems and so on. So you can read all of that, it'd be in the web page anyhow. But the table, if you look at the table, which is the interesting thing, shows that by, by age five, children whose hearing loss was identified by six months were in the 90% percentile for verbal reasoning. They can reason verbally, symbolically, like anybody else. Which includes skills like asking why and answering abstract questions. You move out of the concrete world. Children who were 23 months old, well past the six months, when the hearing loss was identified, in other words, they were deaf, if not totally significantly deaf for 22 months, by contrast, were in only the first percentile, first, first, one, <laughs> first percentile, for verbal reasoning at age five, vocabulary, also cause lag significantly. That's a severe internal developmental interference. It's not caused, it's not caused by external events or external interaction with the child that are inappropriate and create undesirable situation. It's, came by, it's, it's caused by something that happens internally. Um, in London, when I was in London working at the Hampshire Clinic with Anna Freud, we used to have uh, what was called the Hampshire Clinic Blind Nurseries. <laughs> and these were children that were born blind, which was a common phenomenon. 
uh, or have been a common phenomena in, in those days, I'm talking of the 60s, um, all of the 60s, during that decade, premature children were usually placed in a hyperbaric tents, high concentration of oxygen. And people were not aware that that will make you blind. And so, because they were premature and there was some concern about their brain development and their stability, uh, you know, they were checking in terms of their life, survival and so on, they were placed in this hyper hyperbaric chamber, oxygen tends essentially for long periods of time. Fortunately, they became blind, all of them, irremediable blind. And for as long as this was not discovered, as the reason for the blindness of the, these premature babies at the beginning was assumed that because they were premature they were blind. You understand what I mean? That's not really what happened. What happened is that they were made blind by the hyperbaric uh, concentration of oxygen in these tents. Before that was discovered there were any number of blind children in England, all over the world, certainly in London. And so the, the clinic was fed by these children. Well, we studied the development of these children. And it was, I have written about this, you are interested, the, these papers are published in the psychoanalytic study of the child, not only by me, but by many other people that work in the Hampton uh, Child Clinic, in the blind nurseries, trying to show you the difference between the development of the blind and the development of the sighted, and why that difference is. Uh, and it's really very interesting. Essentially, what I was trying to give you is examples of internal, in, in, internal developmental interferences. Now, the external one, remember how we define it, is certain needs, like the plant that I described to you, that it needs a certain temperature, a certain type of soil, a certain type of concentration of object, of oxygen, a certain amount of light. You move it high up in a mountain, the condition has changed. So, you are creating some interference with the needs, and in the case of children, we say the rights of children <laughs> to uh, receive the kind of uh, uh, stimulation and conditions that will make the growth not, no, not only normal, but reach the ideal of normality that the genetic endowment will allow them to reach. All situations, I say here, in which unjustified demands are made of him or her. And we get into that in a moment. Many developmental interferences are not meant to happen at all. They can be described as accidental. They were not intended, they are accidents. Uh, for example, long separation of a mother and her infant baby due to a prolonged illness of the mother or severe depression or schizophrenia or anything of that sort. Why? Because brain development requires stimulation in our culture. The stimulation is mostly provided by the mother, though anybody else could do it, could take the maternal role and provide the stimulation. In our culture, it's generally the mother that provides this. Developmental interferences can come about through the lack of in the indispensable minimum of a stimulation and interaction between the baby and his mother or his environment. And there are many neurobiological consequences of this. That's a developmental interference. In other words, human beings, particularly the brain of the human beings, in order to develop normally, require a certain amount and variety of forms of stimulation without which it will never reach its genetic potential. It has been assumed in the past that just she embryological and anatomical forces which push development to its completion. That's absolutely not the case. Yes, it will complete its development but in a deficient manner. And the fission in this case means a contrast between an IQ of 120 or 40 or 50 and 80 or 70. That's what it means. And it does so by a variety of mechanisms. I'm not going to describe them to you now, but next year, we are going to, next year, next month, we are going to give a lecture 
on this how this interaction takes place, what kind of a stimuli is necessary for dendritization, for myelinization, for increasing dendrites, for organization of brain circuits and so on, and what role maternal stimulation plays in all of this. So I'm not going to get into that today, but if you are interested in that, you can come to that lecture. Indeed, there is a paper written and um, published in the web page that you can download that uh, is the basis of the lecture that I'm going to give uh, next, uh, next month and that was published in a journal called Neuropsychoanalysis. Now, the degree of interference or the developmental interference is obviously depend on the nature of the interference and on the specific developmental stage at which they take place. They are not all the same. You become deaf at uh, two years of age. You won't have the same damage that you if you were born deaf and didn't receive any sound stimulation during the first six months of life. It's the same interference, but the moment at which it takes place, the age may be very significant. Separations of the child from the mother at a time when the child still has a strong biological need for and a right to the mother's presence is another significant interference. During the first few months of life, there is a biological tie between the child and the mother. And any disruption of this can have serious consequences. Now, human nature is, uh, has evolved in such a wise manner that that can be substituted very quickly. In other words, somebody else can take early on the place of the mother, provide the mothering, and there is no difference as long as it happens before the six months of life. You will never detect a difference later on in life. It will be as if that child was with his mother. But if it goes longer than that, then you will start to see the consequences of it in a variety of different ways. Um, let me give you some other example. Parental holidays, for example. Leaving the children behind, maybe with, you know, familiar objects, the grandparents and so on. Well, it depends when you do it. At certain ages, that will not be a very significant event, just like sending them to camp. If they are ready for that and can separate from the parents, that's all right. In fact, it may well be a factor that helps them grow further. But otherwise, it's like sending a child into a nursery school at two years of age when he's not ready to separate from the parents. That's a trauma. He can't be away from his mother. He can relate to strangers, he's frightened, he can master the amount of anxiety that that creates, you know. And uh, so, it, as you see, the timing of when these things happen is very significantly. There are critical periods in human brain development for everything. And remember, our mind functioning, whether normal or whatever psychopathology we develop, is based in this brain functions and the way it gets organized uh, that in that uh, in, in that brain of ours. Mark can prolong the pressure of the mother at many ages will affect its developmental interference will significantly interfere with the development of the child depending on the age will be how significant and how malignant that event might be in terms of the development of the child. Exposure to hunger through neglect or rigid feeding timetables is very. It's a developmental interference. We were not meant to suffer hunger. <laughs> we were meant to be fed when we were hungry. And we can send as infants, babies, signals that a reasonable mother, an expectable mother, as Winnicott would have said, knows my baby is hungry and she doesn't even have to be food. She has her breads to feed that child. But in our wisdom, some people thought, oh, that spoils it. They can only be fed every four hours or every five hours. Well, you are subjecting that child to internal conditions, a homeostatic disequilibrium that he doesn't know what to do with and that if maintained for a certain amount of time and increasing intensity is a trauma for that child. And the brain doesn't develop well if you suffer 
if you suffer traumas constantly, whatever the, provokes them. So exposure to hunger, either through neglect, which happens, you know, or rigid feeding timetables is, is one problem. Hospitalization of the child is another problem, for many reasons. Depending on the age of the child, the separation of the mother may be the most significant separation from the mother, may be the most significant factor, let alone that the child is sick, may have pain, <laughs> and may be subjected to procedures that are not only painful but frightening. And not the child, the young child, is not capable of understanding what that amount of pain is being inflicted in him. You and I know that he's sick and that you have to open his abdomen and get that appendix out and that that may hurt a little bit later on, you know. Uh, he doesn't know anything about that. He doesn't understand. As far as he's concerned, you are hurting him, you know. And, and, and that's the way it is. In other words, you have to reduce yourself to that infant in order to understand that his view of what is happening is not your view of what is happening. And the impact of what is happening is very different from him than your understanding of why the procedures are being done, okay? Obviously we agree to that because they may be life-saving. That is very well for us. Child is being in pain, he's being hurt, he's in top of being sick, he's very, very traumatized. Okay. <clears throat> Illness of a painful nature of of prolonged duration creates all kind of havoc in human development and in brain development. Uh, children that are restricted to bed, for example, sometimes in cast. This is not so common nowadays, but it used to be common when there was something called osteomyelitis, which was an infection of the bone and there were not antibiotics and one of the treatments was absolute repose and they will put you in a cast, you know. And say so that you have it in the femur. Well, you know, that had to be immobilized, among other things, and that child had to be kept uh, very, very quiet for many reasons. Uh, all of these children develop an incredible amount of aggression. They can master later on their aggression very well. They become very aggressive children. And there are books and studies that have been done in these children by several analysts. Very early or rigid toilet training is another problem and a severe one, and we will use an example, that example in a moment. Deaths of parents, deaths of siblings, are significant developmental interferences. None of that is supposed to happen. <laughs> we were not designed to go through that experience at all, uh, as babies or as young infants. Let's talk about developmental conflicts. Developmental conflicts is a completely different kind of situation. Here, and this is perhaps the most important thing, that they are experienced by everybody, by every child. All of us had any number of developmental conflicts. In fact, every phase of development comes with several developmental conflicts that must be mastered if you are going to continue to grow normal. And if you don't master them, then you are starting to create the foundations of the, your neurotic conflicts, as you will see in a moment. So, uh, developmental conflicts are in fact part of normal development, and I'll give you some examples in a moment. For example, when certain specific environmental demands are made at the appropriate developmental phases, or when the child reaches certain developmental and maturational level at which a specific conflicts are created. Yeah? So in the one case, the environment is making demands on the child. In the other case, the demands or the conflict arises, the developmental conflict, because maturation of many cognitive functions in the brain make now things more clear to the infant or to the small child and more aware that he can continue to behave the way he was. And that's a conflict in itself. i give you some examples in, in a moment. So in a way, these are created by the maturational processes themselves, not because somebody 
outside is making demands that are not reasonable. Toilet training, for example, demanded at the appropriate time and in a reasonable form is a good example of what I just told you, number two and three. A specific environmental demands are made at the appropriate developmental phase. If it is the demand is made at the appropriate developmental phase, and this is what this means. People have different ideas about when you can train a child. Hmm? And some people try to start very early. It depends on the parents. Some people have an aversion to dirty nappies and the child, uh, you know, uh, defecating all the time, anywhere he is, and things of that kind, which is understandable. The reality of it is that you have no control over your sphincter, willful, with your will until you are about 18 months of age. So any attempt to try and force you to perform <laughs> the way you will when you are a little older by your parents, any amount of pressure that it put on you uh, before you have reached the capacity to control your sphincter is a significant developmental interference. Do you understand what I mean? He can't do it. Even if he wanted to please you, if he understood what you want, he probably doesn't understand that either. But even if he did, he's not able to control his sphincter yet. So he couldn't do it. When he wants, it will happen because there is something called a gastric reflex in infancy, which means you eat and it comes, something comes out at the other end automatically within a few minutes, within a, a short period of time. Now, some people think that they have trained their children when they had, I have talked to people, say, oh, my child was trained at six months, you know. Uh, <laughs> they were trained at six months. They trained themselves to catch the child, you know, <laughs> evacuation, because they realized that there was this gastric reflex, and shortly afterwards he will defecate. He wasn't doing it to please the parent. He was doing it because that's the way his nature responds to it, and the parent trained himself to catch it that way. But in fact, in reality, you cannot train a child, totally train a child, until he has control over his sphincter. He cannot become clean until at least 18 months of age. And it's very similar in terms of his urethral sphincter, because maturation goes myelinization of the pyramidal ways, yeah, goes from the top of the head to the tip of your toes, and it takes a long time for it to get myelinized efficiently and sufficiently for you to be able to control these sphincters. Now, <clears throat> it's a fine motor phenomenon. You see, that's why as you see, a child can hold his head at about three months, otherwise the head is going any which way. The reason is very simple. Myelinization has gone down enough to control the nerves that control the muscles that maintain the neck erected. So now he can do it. He can even look sideways. That's an enormous achievement. His life now is an 180 degrees life that he can control. He can look wherever he wants while he is an infant. He looks at wherever his head is because he cannot put it anywhere. In fact, there is a stimuli over here. He would like to look, but he can move the head at will because there is not enough myelinization of his pyramidal ways. Then he controls his arms and at three months he can, yeah? use his arms and put his finger in his mouth, same problem. At six months or thereabouts, he can sit holding in the cot. Same reason. Myelinization has progressed further. Now he can control his abdominal muscle and he can maintain that position with some support. You wait another three, eight, seven, four or five months, his legs have become under his conscious control. Now he can start to walk. He will first stand, you know, and be stable, and then he will take his first tentative steps and his myelinization with practice, incidentally. That's a form of a stimulation. 
he needs to practice. There must be somebody who says, come baby, come, come to mommy, and so on. And the baby goes there, you know. And, well, that's external stimulation. It increases the speed of myelinization. And children that are stimulated walk earlier. All right? Now, so, um, the other case is when the child reaches, as I say there in number three, certain developmental and maturational levels at which specific conflicts are created. Let me tell you what this is. <coughs> in a moment, let me get, go through this, follow the... Occasionally, I say here, developmental conflict can be transformed into serious developmental interferences when the demand, even if correct in timing, is made in improper or even traumatic ways. Let's say that the child has already myelinized enough to be able to be in control of his sphincter. And if he wanted to, he could comply with your wishes that he doesn't defecate anywhere he feels like it, but does it in a certain place and a certain time and all of that. If that demand is made in an abusive, threatening, frightening manner, that's traumatic for the child. That's not necessary. And it will interfere. That, that, that is a developmental interference, you know what I mean? It's being done inappropriately. Because you are creating anxiety, fear, fright in the child, and that's not a good thing to do to a, to a child. So even if it is at the correct time, you say, well, it's all enough, now he has to be trained now because I'm tired of this many nappies and all this mess all over the house and so on. If you go about it in a dramatic, inappropriate kind of manner, that's not very wise-sided, not very helpful. Um, let's see. Now, let's talk about toilet training. We said a moment ago that they should be based on maturation of the central nervous system, and that is the myelinization of the pyramidal tracts that control the sphincters, plus the child cognitive ability to understand what you want. In other words, you know what you want him to do. He doesn't. You don't like his feces. To you, that's... Yeah. <laughs> we dispose of them appropriately but for very good reasons. The child has no disgust about his body products at all. In fact, he likes them. And I'm fond to say that if a baby likes you, he will pee on you and defecate on you. Because it's a gift may sound strange to you, but a child will never defecate in somebody that he's frightened of. He won't do it, you know. Because he values his body products. They are not a no no like they become later on in life, you know. As far as he's concerned, there's nothing wrong with that. So when you make these demands and he doesn't understand it, and you do it in an appropriate manner, you are creating a heck of a conflict inside the mind of that little child. Because he can understand why you want, or why you are so upset, or you become so punitive, you know, or so threatening, or in fact punish him physically, corporally, or whatever it is that people will do in such situations. So, the moment the child, though, is aware and it happens at around that time. He doesn't understand this in fine detail, but he understands that you don't like his evacuating the content of his bowels whenever he wants and whatever he wants. He gets the idea that for some reason that he doesn't understand, he wants you to do it in a certain place. Now, we are so dependent in our primary objects and their goodwill and their love and being in the, in the good books, having them loving, not angry, not frightening, not shouting, not threatening, that we are very willing to comply with these things. We are very dependent. The human infant is extraordinarily dependent. So, 
But in any case, if the demands are made before he can understand, accept, and comply with such requirements, that becomes a developmental interference. What is otherwise a normal developmental conflict, in other words, he understands, he now has control of his affinity, he now understands what you want. He knows that for some reason that he may not be able to fathom yet, he knows that you want him not to do what he's doing. And he has then a developmental conflict. It's a conflict between is he going to follow his impulses, his instinct, you know, and get his mother angry, or is he going to do what she wants, she doesn't understand why, and have her happier. And you know what happens, most of us become totally trained, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you know the reason why we do that. Because our need for the love of that object forces education into us, forces us to give up things that instinctually we are not inclined to give up naturally. You understand what I mean? So, <clears throat> for example, to show another example in which uh, this is done in an appropriate manner, I have seen a, a number of uh, parents who force a child to sit on a pot sometimes for hours at a time because they are tired of the child evacuating anywhere. Uh, when this restriction of his motility is less welcome and when he's very frightened because he has to be forcefully kept in there because he's not going to be happy sitting in there for any length of time. And yet, I can tell you that unfortunately these things happen. The developmental interference here is related to the restriction of motility in that case and the negative aspects of the mother-child relationship. And that's a severe developmental interference. It will do some damage to your development. Remember, as I said a moment ago, that the child value very highly his body pros. He doesn't have the same attitude to them that we do. Demands are appropriate when the child can understand them and has developed concern for the feelings and wishes of the object. When his cognitive is developing, has proceeded to such a point that he can look at the mother and get an idea that what she wants or what she wants. He may not understand why it is that she wants that. That may come in much later. But at least he understands what she wants him to do and he has the means to do it, then he has a choice to make. Who is he going to please? Himself or his mother? And generally we please our mothers, yes? If not, you can get into the army at all, right? They don't take people that are not clean and dry. <laughs> you, you'd be surprised. There are adults that are not clean and dry. And if you go into the history, you find a lot of this in there. Okay. <clears throat> so once the child has reached, you know, the forces of development in the different areas of the personality get to certain places, a natural clash is produced. And that's a developmental conflict. Development produces a conflict. You understand what I mean? And the child has to make a decision as to which way he's going to go. A child reaches this stage where he values as much or even more than his body products, his mother, who demands that he renounce his anal pleasures. Now, notice how what was previously a gross developmental interference has become a true developmental conflict through growth, maturation, and developmental process. If you try to do it early, that's a developmental interference. If you do it inappropriately and forcefully, even if he can do it in a frightening way, that too is a developmental interference. If you give him time and let his cognitive knowledge, his cognitive abilities increase sufficiently to understand what is being wanted of him and he has the means to produce <laughs> what they want, then development has reached in both areas, you know, a point at which the question can be posed. What do you want to do? Who are you going to place? And then he makes a decision. And that's a, a decision all for the better. It becomes then at that point an internal developmental conflict because there are now two opposite tendencies inside the child himself. And that's part of superego development. You understand? Not anybody from outside making threats. You do that all. I'm angry and I don't love you. 
or think you are dirty and uh, things of that kind uh, is now inside himself he has to do this it's a conflict inside his own head he has taken him these commands and now introjects in his own head and little bit by little bit he will be uncomfortable if he fails to comply with what was original external demands now are internal demands superego demands understand then the danger of placing too much emphasis on external circumstances as a triggering factor of many neurotic episodes in childhood what I'm trying to tell you is that the developmental conflicts can in themselves create problems without much contribution from the environment. Now, frequently, unfortunately, the contribution is for the, from the environment in the form of a developmental interference, inappropriate way of trying to handle the situation. But even without that happening, the most tolerance of environment, children, yeah, love of their instinctual pleasures varies a lot from one child to another. For some, it's very easy to give up that activity. For some, it is not. And that is an internal conflict. Do you understand what I mean? Because there is a part of him that wants to do it, but there is another part of him that is not letting him do it. And hence the conflict. So, <clears throat> That's why I say that sometimes you don't need a contribution from the outside world to create the problem. We create the problem through developmental imbalances and forces. And it's important, actually, when you are assessing this kind of situation to understand what were the important factors, was the, in, you know, the developmental imbalance in itself, the mismatch between the instinctual wishes and the cognitive purposes. Was that the problem? Or was the problem that the environment interfered with the child very badly? These are two completely different situations. You have the patients in treatment. You have to handle this in very different ways and money. Because, not only because it, it you know, the, theory, the remnant of this conflict that you are observing needs to be handled in relation to its true origin but because otherwise you are not going to be effective therapeutically and because whatever that outcome was is going to be manifested in a variety of different areas these things have a way of spreading and become like character styles and you will observe some behavior that is related to this conflict with control and uh, timing and things of that kind in any number of areas of human interaction of the personality of individuals which will take some effort to say oh but that's related to toilet training but it is if you are not aware of it you will say what the hell is he doing that once you know where the origin of the conflict came from this imbalance you say I know why this is struggle for control, but it's for control of the time that toilet training was an issue. Yeah? Not the same, as I said, whether the conflict was with the outside world or the conflict was an internal one, an imbalance in the maturational forces in the individual. As I said, the individual nature of such conflict is due to the fact that the intensity of the different component instincts is very variable from one child to another, as do the environmental reactions to their instinctual impulses. Clearly, some children can give up this activity very easily. All the children can do that. And you have to have that amount of flexibility and tolerance to understand that some children need a little more time, a little more growth of the cognitive aspects of the ego a little more of the development of the relationship to the, the positive relationship to the mother rather than creating a battle between the mother and the child for control you understand what I mean and if you don't understand this you may be creating problems not meaning to of necessity 
Now, <clears throat> the developmental conflicts, as I told you, are usually specific. There are many developmental conflicts for any phase of development, for any phase of development. Um, in fact, all phases of development have the task of mastering a large number of different conflicts. I give you an example, but there are hundreds of them at all levels of development. But they are usually specific, they belong into that phase, and they are of a transitory nature. If they are negotiated effectively, they disappear, and they make a very positive contribution to personality, organization, and character development. You become a better human being, a better person, a better put together human being, a more capable person, a more capable uh, human being to tolerate stress and to manage uh, control of your uh, instinctual needs and your gratification and so on. You can balance yourself a little bit better. You are not as impulsive, you are not as impulse riddle or instinctual, you know, uh, manage. So they generally disappear more or less completely when the specific phase has passed. If you know how to handle that, as I said, it will leave behind no negative effect. In fact, it will enrich the personality. Because if that doesn't happen, <laughs> a different story will develop, as you will see in a moment. While they are active, though, while the developmental conflict is active, is in the here and now, you will observe anxiety of different types. For example, the child that is willing to please but had an accident, he's very anxious. You know, he will produce symptoms, he will start to cry, he will uh, hide, he will try and hide sometimes his feces. If he's a little older, you know what they do, you know, and things of that kind. So some anxiety of different types, some temporary symptom formation, some behavioral disorders, some face-specific fears are very typical of this developmental conflict, but they disappear the moment the conflict disappears, you know. It's like nightmares in children or tempered tantrums in children, you know. They are common in the second year of life, for example, tempered tantrums particularly in children that don't have mastery of language. Why? Because there is an imbalance between their ability to communicate their needs and the intensity of their needs. So, since you can magically read what they want, they get very upset and go into a temper. The moment they acquire language, say, I want water. They don't go into a temper tantrum, I'm hungry, a cookie, <laughs> whatever it is that they are going to say, you know, and that avoids the problem. So, as you see, there are all of these kind of uh, variations in it. Now, as I said, some conflicts of this type are solved in such a way that some aspects of the component instincts objected to are taken into the personality in the form of character traits, or some reaction formation against them, becoming clean, in the case of totally training, rather than being dirty and smelly and, you know. <laughs> like in, uh, that kind of uh, thing. You develop a reaction formation, you become clean, and that's a highly desirable thing to do. Yeah? Uh, it be brings a lot of rewards uh, all through your life. Now, let's go into neurotic conflicts. This term, as usually employed in psychoanalysis and general psychiatry, has many, many connotations. I use it in a very specific way here, and I want you to be very cognizant of that fact. I restrict its meaning to conflicts that take place among the different psychic structures, it, ego, and the superego. The neurotic conflicts, as I describe them here, are simple units. The neurosis is a bigger organization that contains it's like a big umbrella under which there are many neurotic conflicts that get organized in a certain form and give the shape of the umbrella. But the umbrella is the neurosis, the neurotic conflicts are the units that determine the color, the shape, and the size of the umbrella, which is the neurosis. And the first of these neuroses is the infantile neurosis, as you will see in a moment. So I restrict the meaning of neurotic conflicts to this. 
So when I say neurotic conflict, I'm not talking of a neurosis. I'm talking of a specific unit. And usually it is an instinct and a defense that opposes the gratification of that instinct, or a wish or a longing that is not acceptable. So there is one element going that direction, and another says you cannot go that direction. That in itself is not a neurosis. That's a neurotic conflict. It's one. And it may be simple enough, you know. Now you... S the sum total of all this that uh, you grow through all the faces and all remnants that are left behind make us what we are, give us the character that we have, the characteristic that we have, make us as predictable as we are, <laughs> because we are being driven by these solutions that we were able to reach, whether they are for the better in the in-between or they are for the worse, you know. So, um, they are simple units. Component instincts, of which there are any number, and this is not only in the instinctual sense of the words, longing wishes and things of that kind that may not necessarily be instinctual, uh, but push for gratification, another aspect of the personality that will oppose such, such gratification. We distinguish then from the infantile neurosis or neurosis proper, the neurotic conflicts. The neurosis proper can use and can and usually does include several, indeed many neurotic conflicts, many coming from many different faces. And those, because they are disorganized, one came from here, one came from there, one came from the other place. Once the ego reaches a certain capacity in the cognitive sense of the word, it reorganizes all of this into one structure. It's like a, a general in the army that is fighting several civil wars in the country. He will try to consolidate these different conflicts into one place where he can then deal with it more effectively with the resources that he has. So it makes a kind of condensation at some point, but that requires a certain age, having achieved a certain age, which is a, it means you have achieved a certain amount of cognitive skills that allow you to do this. Or resources, ego resources and ego defenses that allow you to reorganize all of these things that are creating problems into the best structure that you can create in order to deal with it. It's a very efficient way of the personality to try to control it. Um, now, we distinguish neurotic conflicts from the conflicts between the child drives and the external world. That's not a neurotic conflict. Neurotic conflict is internal organization. It's in your head. <laughs> it's forces that are opposite one another inside your mind. Yeah? When you want something and you are in conflict with the environment, that's not a neurotic conflict. That's an external conflict. May have an instinct involved in it. But the objection is not inside your head to the gratification of that instinct, it's in the outside. And as such, it's an external conflict. Indeed, that person is a external object, is not there, is going to gratify the instinct. While, once it is a neurotic conflict, and the forces are inside the head, he can do that. If he does that, he will feel guilty, he will feel ashamed, and he will feel very dysphoric. While in the other case, if the object that objects to it is not there, he will gratificate and be happy as a lark. And no problem with it. It's a person out there. Once that is introjected, though, then you have a problem within yourself because you feel bad when you fail these internal commands. The objection to the discharge of the gratification is in the case of the neurotic conflicts an internalized one. It's never with the outside world, it's already internalized. Now the neurotic conflicts obviously are frequently remnants of previous developmental conflicts that were not well resolved and consequently the situation did not pass 
it created a fixation, it keeps speaking all the time, though it should have silence itself as development progresses, but it doesn't do that. And that's a sign that the, the, what was originally a developmental conflict has now become a neurotic conflict, and the next phase comes, and the manifestations symptomatic anxiety, whatever it is, that was a result of the clashes of the forces in the case of the developmental conflict, now move themselves to the next stage with a resolution of a normal developmental conflict that doesn't happen. It enriches the personality, but the anxiety, the symptoms, the behavioral problems disappear completely. Not in this case. Then you know that developmental conflict led to this neurotic conflict. And that's one unit. That's not the whole neurosis. Remember, there are any number of developmental conflicts that must be mastered successfully. Any, all of those that fail will become the elements in the recipe of the neurosis that you will develop. That combination will acquire special shape, special form. Now, some developmental conflict cannot be solved, and when development proceeds further, they remain behind as unresolved, conflicted areas. What should have been a transitory developmental conflict becomes now a permanent neurotic conflict. Transitory conflicts are thus turned into permanent conflictive areas with permanent pockets of anxiety or symptom formation of a restrictive nature. The neurotic conflicts create favorable conditions for the subsequent development of more complex and organized types of infantile neurosis and then later adult neurosis. And you will see how in a moment. Neurotic conflict will remain active. Once they get established, they remain, they don't go away. The conflict is a permanent one now. It's not like a developmental conflict that gets resolved and is successful and reaches you. This no. This is just the opposite. It has a negative outcome in the form of symptoms, behavior problems, ego restrictions, whatever it may be, and they will stay there long past the time where the stage for that developmental conflict was appropriate. So what happens then is that they remain active and will finally get integrated into the infantile neurosis. First neurosis and then into the later neurosis, the adolescent and the adult the neurosis. As conflicts of an internalized nature, we need to clarify the role that is played by the superego. In other words, once they become internalized, it means that there is something in you that says you cannot gratify that, that's your conscience. When you accepted the demands of your mother that you couldn't defecate wherever you felt like it, yeah, that's a block in the development of your superego. That's one of the nonos of the superego. That's one of the bricks helping to control your instinctual impulses by means of superego activities. Not by ego activities, it's a conflict. <laughs> if you have mastered this without conflict, yeah, then it'd be different. You may have created a reaction formation, for example. That's no problem. If, you are, if we are talking of neurotic conflict, you are talking of something that could not be solved elegantly. It's still there and but the prohibition is there, and the wish for the gratification is there, and so the result and its symptom formation, and of course the horror of the ego, and the superego attitude to this conflict. As conflict of an internalized nature, well, that's what I was telling you. This has a lot to do with the development of the superego. As these things are happening, the superego, as you are internalizing all of these conflicts with the external world, you know. And as you absorb and try to deal as best you can, given your age, with whatever developmental interferences have placed in your way, or whatever your own internal developmental forces create for you, as best you can resolve these things, you know, you are building up 
a superego structure that is model in the objects with whom your instinctual forces were interacting and those that set limit and had the job of educating you and things of that kind. Uh, now the infantile neurosis itself occurs as children pass through the phallic edipal phase. That's usually between two and a half and five years of age. So as you see, it's very early on in life. And now in the nature of regular episodes in a child development, every one of us had an infantile neurosis. It may have been more or less florid, more or less manifest, more or less speaking with a loud voice, more or less visible, but it was there in all cases. And in the best of cases, all you see is, well, he's having nightmares, he's scared of sleeping by himself in his room, you have to leave a light, things of that kind, minimal things that in a few months go by and he, the child doesn't need any of that anymore. But it's important to know that this is essential for normal development because nobody is 100% successful in development. Nobody is. So when you get to the place where the ego has the resources to organize all of these things in the best possible way for it to deal with them and to make the best of it and, and to be able to continue to be functional, it does do so, you know. How good that will look depends on how many problems you have, what was the nature of it, what was the severity of it, from what phases they come, what kind of ego resources you have, how much intelligence you have, how much capacity for sublimation, what kind of defense you use. All of that is enormously variable from one human being to the other. Freud remark how a human child cannot successfully complete its development without passing through a phase of neurosis, sometimes of great and sometimes of less distinctiveness. And he called that the infantile neurosis. So the infantile neurosis is a normal developmental process. But there are two types. There are the one that is very close to normality, and there is the one that is so loaded with neurotic conflicts and developmental unre conflicts unresolved with developmental interferences that is no longer the normal process of the ego making sense of all of this, reorganizing it in a way that is very successful. It can be very successful because there is too much luggage being carried with it. And so that is a more florid, more symptomatic, more noticeable. You say this child is not well, you know. It's not a child that temporarily produces a few nightmares and they are gone. This child is now permanently phobic or whatever it is that he has developed. He has clear manifestations of it. So there are two types of infantile neurosis. The normal one that hopefully we all go through and that that is a little like, it's a caricature of that. It's a little bit exaggerated because so many factors were not handled appropriately, you know, in relation to developmental interferences, how the developmental conflicts were resolved and so on, that the infantile neurosis is not anywhere close to what is normal, but it's actually a pathological uh, situation. <clears throat> so as I said here, the infantile neurosis have both traditionally been used to cover a normal and typical developmental conflict as well as cases of mental pathology in which infantile neurosis has much, much more of a serious connotation. And obviously we need to be able to make a distinction between these two. Uh, it's not uncommon for uh, certain parents to come to you with a child that is producing certain symptoms. And you need to know whether that's part of the normal developmental stage that they are going through the infantile neurosis or is that it's a pathological outcome that it's an intervention. It'd be absurd to have that child in treatment if all it is is the normal manifestation of the normal infantile neurosis. Yeah? So Freud was tempted to claim for this infantile neurosis of childhood the significance of being a type and... Uh, a model 
for all later neurosis. Indeed, all later neurosis will be based on this foundation and will have a very close relationship to it. Now, earlier problems may have determined, for example, important fixation points and directed drive and ego development in certain directions. And then what you see in the final shape of the personality is what we sometimes say, oh, he's an oral character, oh, he has a lot of oral problems, oh, he's an anal character, he has an obsession with neurosis, oh, he's a hysterical uh, personality and things of that kind. It depends where the major conflicts took place because the reorganization by the ego is made around where the major conflict took place. The other becomes subsidiaries to this and will determine, for example, if the major conflict, let's say, is at the phallic edible phase, which will be typical for most normal people, right? Because that's when you have to accept your position in the world. You have to renounce, if you are a boy, let's say, you have to renounce your mother, you have to identify with your father, if you are a girl, you have to do the same the other way around, and you have them to direct your catastic to the outside world and acquire objects and being able to relate and move out of the incestuous family relationship and all of the rest of it. If you have done that successfully, you are in, uh, in good shape, you are, doing, uh, you are in good business. But, if let's say that you are a child in the phallic edible phase has a lot of conflicts, usually if you see a child in that phase that has a lot of this conflict, he develops certain type of symptoms that are typical and normal. For example, he may not like knives. He may be frightened of scissors. He may not want to go to the barber shop. He doesn't like anybody cutting anything out of his body. You know, things of that kind are very typical of it. It's just a short phase, it goes away. If the child, for example, had significant problems during the oral stage in the first year of life, then that same castration anxiety which in the child that has reached the phallic edible phase is manifested as a fear of losing a part of the body through scissors and things of that kind uh, becomes a phobia of animals. Dogs that can bite you and take pieces of you away. You see the oral element? It permeates the higher level of anxiety and it gives them a character that it will not otherwise have. In other words, it's a fear, a specific phobia of animals that bite. And that's the oral influence of that conflict into the later phase. So as you see, these things have a way of interacting with one another. So earlier problems, as I say here, may have determined, for example, important fixation point and directed the drive and ego development into certain directions and certainly what you will observe. And it's not only in terms of symptom formation, let me tell you. It's in terms of ego interest, what you like, what you don't like, what you can do, what you have limitations about. Uh, and it's, 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 you say, well, no, I don't like that. Well, it's not that you don't like that. There are reasons why you don't like that. You may not be aware of what they are, but there probably are good reasons why you have certain preferences and all this, why you can do certain things and all this, why you are comfortable with certain things and not with all this and so on. Um, so, the infantile neurosis is in fact an attempt to organize all the previous and perhaps manifold neurotic conflicts and developmental shortcomings. We saw the conflicts typical of the phallic edible phase into a single organization, into the a single unit of the highest economic significance. See, the ego doesn't want to fight 15 different wars. That's very bad. Has to consolidate his front. And what it does is combines them. That's why it gets this component of the oral phase and mix it with the phallic edible recipe. And then your castration anxiety has oral characteristics. You understand what I mean? Once that has happened, it constitutes the core for all later neurosis and contributed to character and personality development. And there will, of course, be contribution 
by the developmental conflicts that are typical, for example, in adolescence. In adolescence, as you know, there are certain things that you have to master. You have to acquire an identity. As a person, you have to acquire a sexual identity, you have to acquire a professional identity, uh, you have to make a large number of decisions. Similar, there may be developmental interferences in adolescence. You may have a very seductive mother or very seductive sisters that walk naked all over the place or, uh, or a mother that behaves in an inappropriate manner and, and is obviously sexually seductive to the child, perhaps not in the sense of having an incestuous relationship, but in a sense of stimulating a, a, a boy that is at this point uh, producing a large amount of testosterone, you know, and is having a lot of problem by being excited by the presence of his mother, you know, and having a lot, well, that's a significant developmental interference. It's so significant that it may cripple his sexual life later on, you understand, because all objects may become incestuous. He gets excited, it reminds him of the excitement he felt when in the presence of his mother. And that may be a no no, and so he may not be able to. God knows how it will manifest itself, but it will manifest itself in some way or another. So, <clears throat> that's why we say that developmental conflicts are in any phase and make contribution to personality development all the way through until you're developing in the sense of emotional development you know, is complete. It never is complete. We develop all through life until the day we die. But there are certain achievements that are more or less finished when you become an adult. The other things are a different type of development, you know. Now, <clears throat> we are now at the end. And that's, I gave some, I don't know, maybe not all of you have copies. Yeah. How long? All right. This chart essentially uh, is, is very simple. All it does is, is a summary of this. You see that the contribution to the clinical picture listed on the left column. You see that narcissistic disorder, institutionalized children, traumatized children, and social behavior, atypical personality perversion, character disturbance, including normality. And this comes, as you see, from the middle of the column, where you see developmental interferences, all of which, depending on which stage, may, can make contribution to these elements on the left column. And then you see the developmental conflict. And there is an arrow that goes to one from the other, but it doesn't mean to say that there is a, a step from developmental interference to developmental conflict. Developmental interference can happen at any stage in life. Developmental conflict can happen at any stage in life. Finally, you get to the neurotic conflict. So all of that will make contributions to the whatever type of psychopathology you see on the left. And you see the neurosis proper in the end. And, and that's essentially, if you look at it, uh, that gives you a, a, a reasonable summary. But let me say this, it'd be easier, for example, to deal with a social behavior here on the left, resulting from neurotic conflict, that with a social behavior resulting from a defective superego structure, itself the result of undesirable developmental interferences, for example, because that's an ego defect. While a neurotic conflict you can handle, an ego defect you cannot. Not by our means. Scheme that you have in there. Let me get my own now that I lost it. But as you see, there is a kind of this to all of these things that are on the left. Whether it is normality or is any form of character pathology. And you see, I was careful in having very general outlines of the outcomes. In other words, maybe uh, the ins picture of the institutionalized child, which in fact is uh, very typical, or a narcissistic disorder or a social behavior, rather than say, oh, hysteria, obsessional neurosis, uh, you know, phobias and things of that kind. But that's more specific. And one c could do that, actually. In fact, you can dissect a phobic patient and go back and look at uh, how it got to be 
phobic patient and why this particular phobia and so on if you have the patient long enough and you get enough of the, of the history. But that was not the purpose of this exercise but to give you a general outline like uh, the skeleton the structure of what is based on neuroscience in the sense that development and brain development and emotional development are very, very much linked and get to certain results. If you want to be more specific, we can do that. There is no question that we can do that. Um, now, <clears throat> then on the right, as you see, well, if you follow the scheme, it goes to neurotic conflicts, then it goes to the neurosis proper. The first one is the infantile neurosis. And uh, you can have an infantile neurosis. We all do, the normal infantile neurosis. But then you can become a character disturbance, or a, a pervert, or an atypical personality, or a delinquent, or what not. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that your infantile neurosis will stay at that level. It depends on what else came to influence it. And it depends on all the factors as well. For example, if you grew in a family that had no standards, <laughs> ethical standards, and that's what you learn, then the elements, the bricks that go into the building of your superego are going to be limited. And if your father is a thief and is delinquent, and that's acceptable in, in your environment, you are a thief and a delinquent. And you have no guilt by stealing from somebody or conning somebody or whatever. Well, that's different from a stealing, going and uh, becoming a kleptomanic because of neurotic conflicts. That you can treat. But the ego defect, the lack of character developing in the sense of a, a controlling a structure of the superego is something that you can cure by psychotherapy. You just can't cure it. It's a, that's that's a, a developmental lack. Now, can you not help them at all? No, that's not true. You can help them, but you cannot help them by psychoanalytic treatment or dynamic psychotherapy by itself. You need to do other things as well. You have to do a, a cognitive a therapy and a cognitive appealing if this person is an intelligent person yeah, you have to demonstrate to him that the method that he was forced to adopt in order to adapt to his environment was appropriate when he was a child now is going to land him in jail and he has resources to do better than that and you can then work between whatever the infantile neurosis was like and the defect is like, but these are two very different kind of things. You understand what I'm saying? Now, on the uh, right column... Dr. Nauer, would it be true to say that there are going to be little elements of that in, in any analytic treatment of a, of a healthier neurotic patient? That there are going to be moments when there will be a little bit of those... Yeah, very little bit, very little bit. If there is a lot, then there is more to it than just a typical neurotic development. But yeah, development is very complex and, uh, you know, it hardly ever happens in the ideal conditions, uh, you know. Uh, let me just finish this and then I go to your question. As you see on the right, there is something called developmental disturbances. I didn't mention this, but I want to now. Developmental disturbances of one sort or another, it says here, for example, these disturbances, tempered tantrums, I mentioned those, uh, bedtime ceremonials, other forms of ritualistic behavior, adolescent disturbances, etc., are called developmental disturbances. For example, it is normal. Certain sleep disturbances in children are normal at a certain age. And you need to know that because these parents will come to you and say, what do I do? Well, some people will nowadays that everything is throw a pill at, they may give them a hypnotic medication. It's an absurdity to give medications that may affect brain development in infants while the brain is in the process of development, for God's sake. And it's something that is going to pass. It's, it's, it's like the example I gave you, the tempered tantrum. This child is having tempered tantrums because there is an imbalance 
between his needs and his capacity to express what he needs so as to get it gratified. And because you can read his mind, you know, and give him what he wants, he finally goes into a, what is essentially a temper tantrum, which is a little trauma. That's not good. It's a traumatic event. He's overwhelmed by his affect, by his need, you know. And has no means of letting you know what it is. That's not good for anyone, you know. Obviously, you give him a little time. He acquires languages and then he can tell you what he needs. You don't have to be a magician and read his mind. And the temper tantrums are gone because they were related to these are typical developmental disturbances. They are not neurotic disturbances. They are not neuro the result of neurotic conflicts. They are not, you know, it's a different kind of phenomena. It's related to brain maturation, essentially. And uh, that's what happens. It's closely related to the developmental conflict than it is to anything else. But it's certainly not a neurotic conflict. Yes, sir. Well, I'm curious about the uh, issue of brain development and neuroses, because as if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, a neuroses, in order for a neuroses to develop, there has to be um, an issue of maturation, of brain maturation specifically. Sure, sure. This has a, a firm neurological foundation. Sure. And that once that neuroses is established um, in the neurological system, then it becomes, in some sense, hardwired. It is hardwired, yeah. And, and that, therefore, a developmental crisis as opposed to a neurotic crisis uh, is one that never reaches that stage of being essentially encoded as a, as a brain, uh, on the brain level, or the deep cellular level, of a particular pattern of function or dysfunction. Well, and that's what we are learning now in neurosciences. That's what they imagine. Uh, procedures that are now commonly used to investigate mental functioning and mental illness and so on are demonstrated. And it's very interesting because what you say is absolutely correct. You see, these experiences, up to very recently, we could only look at them from the angle of psychology and use psychological language to describe this phenomena. Now we can retranslate that into what happens to the brain you know, both ways, from outside to the brain and from the functions of the brain to the outside. And what people are finding is that indeed this get encoded in circuits in the brain that become active. And indeed, when you are in the presence, let's say, of a phobic animal, there are certain areas in your brain that deal with fear and anxiety and so on that light up as if they were in fire, you know, in images in imaging procedures with some contrasting medias that will allow you to see where the activity in the brain is taking place. So is there an actual morphological transformation of the brain matter? No, it's not a morphological transformation. It's that the brain has, it's like a very complex um, circuit organization with billions of, many billions of cells and dendrites and connections. And for a certain experience, a certain path is the one that gets activated. The rest is not, but that one is, and you can see that in an imaging procedure. Now, what is interesting is that, for example, it's being demonstrated that what we call the or people used to talk, to call the talking cures, you know, produce the same effect. And, Absolutely. They can change the pathway, they can create a new pathway, they have, they have the same effect of some of the psychopharmacological interventions which are supposed to be successful. And people are learning more and more about it. But there is no question that all of these things have to be somewhat imprinted in that brain that is inside here. We of course talk of this at the experiential interrational, behavioral, psychological level. But there is a neurophysiological level that is the basis of all the things that we do in our heads. Yeah. Is part of this discovery also that the brain continues to develop right into, right into old age? Well, Neuroses are possible to develop? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, neuroses are possible to develop at any point. 
indeed you can be traumatized and damaged in that sense at any point because you can overwhelm the circuits you can create imprint new circuits let's say by traumatic experiences for example even if you are 60 years old that could happen uh, but yes and no you see brain maturation seems to finish sometime in adolescence actual maturation of the brain it used to be that we used to think that usually by the third year of life, two and a half, three years of life, the brain has acquired its final shape. That's not true. In fact, we are now finding that in adolescence, there is a second pruning. There was a first pruning in the first year of life. There is a second pruning in adolescence. And a lot of information is coming out that explains why the adolescents are impulsive at that particular point in time how this pruning and this maturation final stages of maturation of the brain help give us the ego resources to establish better reins and control of our own impulses in the past we have described all of this in psychological terms because that's the level of observation that we were able to to, to see, that's what we saw. Nowadays we can correlate that to what is happening inside that structure. And the correlation is fascinating, incidentally. There is, for those of you that are interested, in the next week or ten days, I will uh, put in the, in the web page. The web page has many sections, All right? Some of them are strictly psychological sections, psychoanalytical sections, and so on. There is one called self-learning in the behavioral sciences. And in that section I will place a lecture given by Dr. K. recently at the university. What, were you there? You weren't there? It's a wonderful lecture. He had taken the trouble of reviewing all the information that there is in neurosciences nowadays we see machine procedures and how psychotherapy works and why it works and uh, why the talking cures are effective and so on which a lot of people has questioned in the past uh, they no question anymore about any of this really and uh, if, if you watch that that is a fascinating trip on what neuroscience has achieved in the last six seven years you know it's very well done. He doesn't do anything original. He just reviewed it, but uh, he reviewed it so thoroughly and he was able to organize his review in such an elegant manner that you learn an enormous amount by listening to him. If you are interested in how the brain develops, as I said, there is another paper in there, in the um, paper section on brain development and brain maturation and maternal stimulation which I wrote uh, a year or two ago and was published in neuropsychoanalysis. So that's essentially what I wanted to tell you for today. Let, if you have any questions I try to answer them.